Doctors have known for a very long time, probably for thousands of years, that patients vary in the response to the treatments that doctors give. So if you're a doctor treating 10 patients, all of whom have the same disease, and you give them all the same medicine, one thing you'll see and one thing that the patients will see is that the outcomes of that treatment varies. Some people will have the desired outcome, some patients won't get any benefit from the medicine, and some patients will get bad side effects from that medicine, from the same dose of the same medicine. And so one of the things that doctors have been interested in, as I said literally for thousands of years, is what are the causes of this individual variation in treatment response? Now, there have been a long list of suspects that doctors have wondered about. Is it something about the patient's diet? Is it something in the patient's environment? Or is there something intrinsic to the patient themselves, something gen genetic or heritable that causes these variations in treatment response? Now, one of the areas of major research about this now is a field that has come to be called pharmacogenomics, a hybrid between pharmacology and modern genomic science. And this field really got going early in the 20th century when doctors first realized that just as humans' bodily structures, just as human anatomy varies from person to person, around the turn of the 20th century, doctors realized that people's internal structures and their internal chemistry varied as well. And these variations in drug metabolism were probably under genetic control. Now, when that idea was first proposed, it was just a plausible idea. It wasn't really until the 1940s and the 1950s that doctors developed the skills in genetic science to really test that hypothesis out. And there was a series of researchers doing work in the late 1940s into the early 1950s where what they would do is they would pay close attention to how patients were responding to medicines. They would identify patients who had unusual reactions to these drugs, and then they would look at family members of those patients to see if other people in the family also had this kind of peculiar reaction to drugs. And by doing this, doctors were able to identify a series of families who had very unusual reactions to drugs. And some of these things were quite dangerous. For instance, there's one disease that had been observed repeatedly over the past hundred years called malignant hyperthermia. And what happens there is a patient decides to have surgery and the doctors use the same kind of anesthesia that they would use for anyone, and something will go wrong, not with how the doctors give the anesthetic, but with how the anesthetic interacts with the patient's body. And this can be dramatic and life-threatening. People can have temperatures of 107, 108, even 110, and it can be a highly lethal disease. And so doctors realized that malignant hyperthermia could run in families. If you had a relative who this had happened to, it was at greater risk of happening to you. And they did work in the 1960s and 1970s and figured out genes that were associated with the risk for this disease. So by the 1970s and 1980s, doctors had identified probably 15 or 20 different genetic alleles that had a significant impact on how patients responded to drugs. Now, over the course of the 1990s and into the 2000s, there have been major discoveries in genetics and now the field of genomics this field of pharmacogenomics has exploded. It's become much, much easier for doctors to screen patients uh, for different genetic variants and, for, and to understand what these genetic variants are actually doing. If you go to the website for the Food and Drug Administration, you can find lists of drugs, 80, 100, 120 drugs, for which they think there are significant genetic factors that influence the metabolism of this drug. And the idea behind this if you're a patient or if you're a doctor who's starting a patient on one of these medicines, it might be important to do a gene test on this patient in order to see if they're going to be at risk of one of these unusual reactions. And so this is the field of pharmacogenomics. Now, over the past few years, this has received increasing attention, mostly because the costs of genetic testing have decreased, making this technique clinically useful without bankrupting the healthcare system. And the, has gotten folded into this question of personalized medicine. Now, again, this is an old idea in medicine, the idea that if you're a doctor taking care of a patient, when you make your treatment decisions, you want to customize your treatment decisions based on the patient's disease, their lifestyle, their family history. And now you can do this on the basis of genetics. And there's so much enthusiasm now about pharmacogenomics that if you look at editorials that are being written recently, by very prominent people, by people like Francis Collins, who's the director of the National Institutes of Health, 
or someone like Margaret Hamburg, who's the director of the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. For these people, personalized medicine has become genomic medicine. They're really not interested in patients' diet or exercise or where they live or how they live. What they're really interested in is genomics. Do the gene testing, find the variants, and then individualize medical treatment on the basis of that. Now, this kind of medicine, this kind of personalized pharmacogenomic medicine, is an excellent idea, and it certainly has the potential to transform medical practice. Two questions come up. One is, how likely is it that it will transform medical practice? And a second question is, what are the opportunity costs of this kind of investment in pharmacogenomics, as opposed to other things that researchers or doctors or patients could be doing to optimize the outcomes of medical treatment? Now, the answers here are complicated. If you talk to different people, you'll get different answers. Uh, but one thing is clear, that for most drugs, you probably don't, rely, you don't need to rely on pharmacogenomic testing. For as long as doctors have been practicing medicine, they've been doing drug dosing on a trial and error basis. You diagnose a disease, you try a drug, you have the patient come back and see if you've achieved the desired response. Now, for diseases that aren't immediately life-threatening, and for drugs that are relatively safe drugs, for which there's not a fine balance between safety and side effects, this trial and error approach has worked well, and has worked well for hundreds or thousands of years. Now, there certainly are some drugs, especially modern drugs, which are much more dangerous than traditional medicines were. And there are many diseases that are life-threatening, where you can imagine it would be useful to get the patient on the proper dose immediately, not after the result of trial and error that takes place over weeks or months. But if you knew exactly at the outset what the dose should be, you can provide much better care for that patient. Well, can genomics deliver that? The proponents of pharmacogenomics will say, yes, we can do that. But there are a lot of people who are skeptical. And the problem here is that human organisms, like all living creatures, are complicated. And the genes that regulate or that influence our lives are complicated. And so if you take a typical drug that a person is going to ingest, it's not a question of there being a single gene that determines the resulting concentration of the drug in the patient's body. Drugs get metabolized by different enzymes. They bind to receptors. Those receptors have different affinities. There are other drugs that break down. There are other enzymes that break down the drugs. There are probably, for any given drug, 10, 15, 20, maybe even 50 genes that are influencing the individual's response to this drug. So to do proper pharmacogenomic analysis, you'd really need to have detailed knowledge of every gene that's evolved and exactly what impact those genes have on the drug and how all of those variations work together. Now, that's certainly a solvable problem. It's conceivable that doctors will figure that out. But that's not where pharmacogenomic science is in 2014, and it's not clear if that's where it will be anytime soon. So the big questions are, what percentage of drugs and diseases have such a narrow therapeutic window to justify this kind of pharmacogenomic testing? And how well will scientists develop this science? Will it be able to deliver on the promises that they're making now? Now, in the meantime, Genes are just one of many things that influence how patients respond to medicines. Just as they've been doing this work on pharmacogenomics, doctors have realized that the food we eat affects medications. Grapefruit are probably the most famous example, but it turns out if you eat a lot of grapefruit, it can totally confound treatment of blood pressure. And if you're on a drug called Coumadin or Warfarin, which is used to prevent blood clots, that can be influenced by green leafy vegetables. So if you're taking Coumadin, you're not supposed to eat spinach or kale or chard because that can influence this. And cigarettes are also notorious for disrupting drug metabolism. The, if you are a habitual smoker, it tends to upregulate your drug metabolizing enzymes. So smokers often see less of a therapeutic response to medicines than non-smokers do. And when I was doing work in psychiatry, one of my colleagues almost had a patient die because that patient quit smoking unbeknownst to the psychiatrist and then suffered a series of side effects because the, drug, the, the concentration of the drug increased significantly in response to this patient's desire to quit smoking. And so there are many, many things that patients are doing, what they eat, what they smoke, what they drink, that influence drug metabolism. And the effects of those 
behaviors are often comparable in magnitude to the effects of the drugs. And then an even bigger question is the reliability with which patients take their medicines. Again, doctors have known for thousands of years that when you give patients detailed instructions on what to do to take care of their health, to eat well, to exercise regularly, to sleep well, and to take these medicines every day, patients don't follow those instructions 100%. There are good reasons and bad reasons why that happens, but doctors and patients have long known that to be faithful in the daily ingestion of pills is really, really difficult to do. Sometimes, with the case of birth control pills, this can cause unwanted pregnancies. Other cases, it just caused treatment failure. Now, in the United States, at least, estimates of noncompliance are about 50%. So if you give a patient a prescription, the odds are they'll take half those pills. That is a huge effect on the level of the drug that the patient's body will actually get. And that effect is much, much larger than many of the effect size reported for pharmacogenomics. So if you're a doctor and you want to get the best possible outcomes for your patients, should you do a thousand dollar gene test to find out their drug metabolizing variants? Or should you figure out what's preventing them from taking their pill every day and working with the patient, working with them respectfully to figure out what you can do to get them to be more reliable and actually taking the medicines, I suspect that latter approach will have a much bigger impact on healthcare outcomes than the massive investment that we're doing now in pharmacogenomics. Mm -hmm.